Um, we'll start again with the Heart Sutra. And um, hopefully as time goes by, the Heart Sutra makes more and more sense. And once we get to the middle way consequence tenant school, we'll go more specifically into the details of what does this mean and what does that mean. But for now, I just want us to get used to the words of it. So again, it's in the back of how things exist on page 115, how things exist page 115. And so today I thought that we'd do the chanted English version. We won't always do it this way, but some people find it easier to connect if there's sort of a, a rhythm. So um, if this isn't your style at home, don't worry about it. We'll um, alternate back and forth between reciting straight and recited in a chanted way. So chanting. I prostrate to the Arya triple gem. Thus did I hear at one time the Baga one was dwelling on mass of vultures mount in Rajagriya to gather with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. At that time the Bhagawan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time the Bodhisattva Mahasat Arya Avalokiteshvara looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then through the power of Buddha, the venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva Mahasa, Arya Avalokiteshvara, how should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that in the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara said this to Venerable Shariputra. Putra. Shari Putra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it like this correctly and repeat it, beholding those five aggregates also as empty of of inherent nature. Form is empty, emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional facts, and consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena are empty, it's without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore, in emptiness, there is no form, no feel, no discrimination, no compositional fact, no consciousness. No eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind. No visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch, and no phenomena. There is no eye element, and so up to and including no mind element, and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no distinction of ignorance, and so on, up to and including no aging and, and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffer, origination, cessation, and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. 
Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom. The mind without obscuration and without fear, having completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifest, completely awakened to unsurpass a perfect, complete enlightenment and reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequal, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffer, should be known as truth since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared. Tayata gate gate aragate arasvam gate vodhiyasoha Shariputra the Bodhisattva Mahasattva should train in the found perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagavan arose from that concentrate and commanded the Bodhisattva Mahasa Arya Avalokiteshvara saying, Well said, well said, son of the lineage, it is like, it is like that one should practice the profound perfection of with, just as you have indicated, even the Tathagatas rejoice. The Bhagavan having thus spoke, the venerable Sharivati Putra, the Bodhisattva Mahas, Arya Avalokiteshvar, those surrounding in their entirety, along with the world, God's humans, Asuras and Gandavas, were overjoyed and highly praised that spoken by the Bhagavan. And sitting with that. So the Heart Sutra, just, you know, before we unpack it too much, just in case people are getting confused by all of the not this, not that, no this, no that, remember that in the beginning it says no inherently existent this, that, this, that. And we're to understand that that no inherently existent goes with all of the other negations. It goes with all of the other nots and no's. So we're not saying um, there isn't any eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind. We're saying there's no inherently existent this, no inherently existent that. Okay, so um, don't, don't get lost by the no's. Last week, we did um, a review on the nine stages of mental abidance and the five paths. And um, I just wondered if you had a chance to do the recommended reading in Virtue and Reality on the Five Paths. Were you guys able to do that? Kind of um, show of hands. Basically, if you didn't do it, I'm going to read it to you. And if you did do it, we'll skip it. So <laughs> raise your hand if you did the reading. Half? Quarter? Maybe only a quarter. OK. Only a quarter of you. So, okay, we're going to have to read it then. Um, so if you want to read along, I'll put it on the share screen. But if you prefer paper, we're going to start on page 38 of Virtue in Reality. 
and remember that these five paths are referenced in the Heart Sutra in the Tayata Om Gate Gate Paragate Parasam Gate Bodhisoha. The mantra is an indication of what the five paths are and an impetus for us to engage with them. So the five paths are really important to understand for tenants, for the nine stages of mental abidance, for the 12 links of dependent arising, everything. So getting the, the five paths clear in our mind, at least in a summary version, is, is really important. Lama Zappa Rinpoche says, the five paths, when you realize calm abiding, you can concentrate single pointedly on whatever object you choose for as many months or years, even eons as you like, as determined by your motivation. No matter how many distractions around you, police sirens, train whistles, people beating drums in your ear, nothing can disturb your mind or interfere with your concentration. However long you plan to concentrate, that's how long you can keep your mind on the object, immovable as a mountain. Not only that, but you also experience rapturous ecstasy of body and mind. Your body feels as light as cotton, as if you could float away, and very, very healthy. You can use your body in any virtuous action or practice with no hardship or difficulty whatsoever. Your mind is so controlled that, as I mentioned, you can concentrate on any object for as long as you like. And if you let go of your mind, it automatically gravitates to virtuous objects. So there's no danger of creating any negative karma. The great advantage of having achieved calm abiding, however, is that it now becomes very easy for you to achieve other realizations. In particular, you can meditate on emptiness as your object in order to develop special insight and the wisdom that is the actual antidote to the suffering of samsara. The Four Noble Truths, the foundation of Guru Shakyamuni Buddha's teachings, are true suffering, true cause of suffering, true cessation of suffering, and true path. True path means the wisdom directly perceiving emptiness, the very nature of phenomena, ultimate nature. This is what actually ceases the delusions, the cause of all suffering, the cause of cycle of rebirth, aging, sickness, and death, the cause of hell realms, the hungry ghost realms, the animal realms, and all the sufferings those rebirths entail, and the cause of the human asura and sura realms and all their suffering as well. When you achieve the wisdom directly perceiving emptiness, you attain what's called the right seeing path or the path of seeing. It is here that the delusions, the obscurations, the defilements actually begin to cease. In all, there are five paths to liberation from suffering and its cause, the paths of merit, preparation, right seeing, meditation, and no more learning. By developing the wisdom realizing emptiness, motivated by the method of renunciation of samsara, the determination to free yourself from samsara, you can achieve your own liberation. By achieving the right seeing path, or the path of seeing, you remove 112 disturbing thought obscurations, and on the path of meditation, 16 disturbing thought obscurations. However, you destroy not only the delusions, but their seeds as well, so that it becomes no longer possible for them to ever arise again. This means that you will never again create karma or have to experience suffering. You become an arhat, your holy mind, free from obscurations of disturbing thoughts. You attain nirvana, the sorrowless state, and liberate yourself from the entire round of samsaric suffering. To achieve enlightenment for the benefit of numberless other sentient beings, you need to achieve the five Mahayana paths, which are also called merit, preparation, seeing, meditation, and no more learning. Here, no more learning means omniscient mind, 
the completion of all understanding. There's not a single object of knowledge left to discover. Again, it is on the Mahayana right seeing path that your wisdom directly perceiving emptiness starts ceasing the delusions. Anyway, there are many details of these paths and many texts describing them, of which the Abhisamaralakara is probably the best known. In the great Tibetan monasteries, such as Sarah Gandhan and Drepung, the monks study many root texts and commentaries that detail the five paths and so forth. They memorize, debate, and meditate for 30 or 40 years. It's a bit like one person trying to learn all the parts of an airplane and how they all function together so that they can fly safely. Anyway, to attain your own liberation from samsara, you need to understand the details of the five paths. The right seeing path eliminates intellectual wrong conceptions, those acquired from incorrect teachings, while the path of meditation eradicates the innate misconceptions, the ones you were born with and have on your mental continuum since beginningless time. After that, you reach the fifth path, that of no more learning, and attain nirvana, the sorrowless state. To reach enlightenment for the sake of all sentient beings, you have to follow the five Mahayana paths. When you achieve the Mahayana right seeing path, you also eradicate gross obscurations, which prevent you from attaining your own liberation from samsara. But in addition, you eradicate the subtle obscurations, the negative imprints left on your mental continuum by the gross delusions, which prevent you from attaining enlightenment. So there's more in this text on the five paths, and um, I think it'd be useful to read it. Um, starts on page 43. And um, so I recommend you read that in your own time. Okay, so the five paths, basically we need to understand that it's like developmental stages. It's basically, what happens when your mind develops like critical mass about a certain content or a certain idea? It's that shift from head to heart that we've all experienced at various times in our life where we've known something for a really long time and then finally it sinks in and touches our heart and changes our behavior. Do you know what I mean? Like we say in English, the penny drops. Yeah, or something has like the ring of truth. Um, you know, um, the example I always use is, you know, my uh, teachers would always say to me when I was a little kid, you know, my school teachers, you know, treat other people the way you want to be treated. You know, like everybody's teachers say that, right? And I thought, yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. Um, and then I think, I don't know, it was probably embarrassing how old I was when it finally it occurred to me, oh, I could treat others the way I want to be treated, <laughs> right? Like I'd heard it a million times, but like finally I went, oh, that's a really good idea. <laughs> you know, like it sunk in. And it was so simple and it was something I understood intellectually for years, but it's like I'd thought about it enough that finally I understood and this is the way the five paths are, is that you understand something and then you really do have to repeat it and hit it from a lot of different angles. And eventually it has enough power to shift into a realization. So then what is the role of Shine in the five paths? Shine, Shamatha, Calm Abiding, Serenity, all the synonyms. What's the point of it? Why do we need it? Yeah, let's not. I guess it's actually the ability to concentrate on emptiness. Yeah, yeah, very, yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. And it's the ability to concentrate on emptiness without being distracted by the analytical mind. So can you kind of feel intuitively how that might be the case? Like if you're meditating on something easier, easier, you know, easier in the sense of intellectually easier, like compassion. You have to think about compassion a lot in your life for it to be something that you understand in a vast way, in a deep way, and in a personal way, as well as in a social political way. 
right? It's something that, you know, you, you can spend a lot of an analytical time thinking about compassion and reinforcing how incredibly important it is in our lives. But it can get to the point where you're so familiar with compassion, what it is to give it, what it is to receive it, that you could meditate single pointedly on it without analysis, right? Like you could think your way into like resonance with just the essence of compassion and just like feel it to just be in it and to kind of hold your concentration in that. And maybe that's something that we've done, like if we've been next to someone who's really ill or next to someone who's grieving and they're saying things or they're crying or whatever's happening and you're just like holding the space for them with compassion and you're not thinking analytically about what should I say? What should I do? What should I say? What should I do? You're not being neurotic. You're not being a problem solver. You're just flooding them with care energetically. You know that experience? So it becomes like something you understand analytically, but you bring it into single pointedness and you just kind of staying there. And you can do that in a meditative setting or you can do that in just a walking around daily life setting. But because you understand compassion so well, bringing it to single pointedness is possible. And you're not too distracted by all your ideas about compassion. The, when we're meditating on emptiness, right now we still don't quite have a handle on what it is even intellectually, which is why we're studying tenets, right? We're studying the philosophical tenet schools in order to intellectually really refine our understanding of emptiness so that it's precise. You know, just like when you're meditating on compassion, you're trying to get it precise in the sense of free from attachment, free from expectations, free from blah, 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 right? Right now, we're trying to understand emptiness in terms of what isn't it, and as well as what it is. And if we were to try to meditate on emptiness single pointedly right now, we really wouldn't know what we're doing. You know, we would kind of, um, we would maybe blank out <laughs> or disassociate or think of the sky or have kind of staticky no thoughts, or you know, none of which is the point, none of it which is what we should be doing. But sometimes people will go to some like pop yoga class, you know, not like a real yoga class, but like some sort of westernized new agey, you know, silly yoga class. And the teacher probably with good intentions, but with no education says, now let's meditate on emptiness, empty your mind, you know, and it's to like encourage relaxation or something. That is not what we're talking about in Buddhism. And I know that you guys know that by now, but if you don't know that, click it in, <laughs> okay? But it shows that we can't meditate single-pointedly on emptiness yet, because we don't really understand what we're doing. Do you know what I mean? Right now we have to rely on analysis and we need to work on single-pointedness as a separate project. And we develop single pointedness in relation to things we can get a grasp on, like the breath, like the clarity of the mind, or like the concept like compassion, or on a mental image like you did last week. So last week, you know, there was a, an encouragement to use either the image of Shakyamuni Buddha or the image of golden light in your mind's eye and to hold your attention on that as another form of developing single pointedness. So your analysis and your single pointedness are two separate projects and eventually you can bring them together and eventually you'll be able to bring them together on emptiness. Is it kind of all kind of coming together or, or do you want to clarify any bits? Hi, um, maybe I'm misunderstanding or making it a bit superficial, but it sounds like you're saying that Shine is more experiential and analytic is more intellectual. In, in the beginning, that I think that is true. Yeah, I think in the beginning that is true. Although I think even single pointed concentration in the beginning is strangely intellectual because we're trying to find what it is we're trying to land on. So we're using a lot of analysis to try and get to, okay, what about the breath am I focusing on? Am I focused on here at the nose, down at the tummy, which part of it, you know? 
or if I'm focusing on some mental image, you know, you hold it in your mind, but then it kind of drifts and you have to kind of pull it back and, you know, or it'll shrink or it'll expand and you're like, so you're still using some less quote experiential more analytical abilities to get your single pointed concentration and then you kind of merge with it and maybe that comes easier in the beginning with single pointedness whereas with analysis it's more intellectual by nature i guess but it does become quite experiential with repetition so it's like the first time you meditate on loving kindness, you might not feel loving kindness, even though you feel loving kindness in your daily life towards all sorts of people, you don't feel it in the meditation. You're just kind of like, all right, <laughs> you know, you're walking yourself through stages and sometimes you'll touch it and sometimes you won't. But with advanced analytical meditation, it is very experiential and you're really using logic as a gateway to experience. I wanted to ask, continuing to what Mika said, is it kind of from uh, conception to perception that you're talking about, in a sense? Colloquially, yes, and then technically, yes, both. <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. So um, kind of a more advanced presentation of those five paths, I thought to just very gently look at and see how it goes. So <clears throat> here at number one, for sharp faculty trainees, they have a inferential realization of emptiness before they even start the path. So this could be us. This could be us where we're working on this inferential realization of emptiness. And we don't have any renunciation yet. We don't have any bodhicitta yet. You know, we can stop and think about those two and try and generate it, but it's not coming spontaneously and effortlessly. It's not an actual realization yet. Um, you know, the actual beginning of the path of accumulation is this uncontrived renunciation and mind of enlightenment. And the path of accumulation has stages within itself. So, at this beginning point, the path of accumulation is when you officially become a bodhisattva. And there's small, middling, and great sections to it. And it can take one countless great eon, which is like a huge amount of time to go from the path of accumulation all the way to the path of seeing. Now, it doesn't have to take that long if you, for example, practice Tantra, but um, just kind of know that this section will take a while. And that can kind of overwhelm us and say, oh my gosh, like what's even the point? Why don't I just like enjoy my life? <laughs> you know, like why even bother? Let's just try and like take the edge off of suffering, you know, and like eat healthy and go for walks and be nice to people and not overthink it. You know, <laughs> like, it, you know, you can look at charts like this and be really daunted but I think we forget that we have so many past lives of merit and momentum towards a spiritual path. It's not like we're starting from the very beginning. It's just we're not tapping into the energy that we've already started. And I feel like what we've done as humanity or as we, what we've done for our own mental continuum as an individual, both, is that we kind of start and we start, you know, moving and we get into kind of a renaissance individually or societally. And then we get distracted and selfish and fall into a dark age. <laughs> and then we kind of pull ourselves out of it and kind of get momentum again and start going again and move towards another renaissance. <laughs> and then we start to really achieve things in terms of, I don't know, advancement in ideas advancement in understandings, advancement in depth. And then we get distracted and selfish again and fall into a dark age. You know, that's what we do as society. That's what we do as an individual. That's what we've done from beginningless time. And so, well, I think the, the important thing here is to think there is nothing really new in samsara. A lot of the energy that I put towards, I don't know, seeking new peak experiences is better served if it's internally rather than externally. Because externally, all of us are adults, we know if you travel somewhere, 
there is interesting food, interesting culture, interesting architecture, interesting landscape anywhere. You know, it's just variations on a theme. Like, do you really need to go to Greece? You know, do you really need to go to Paris? It's like, there's cool stuff everywhere. <laughs> there's novelty to be found everywhere. Do we really need to keep reinventing the wheel? And these kind of outer chasing behaviors are what prevent our progress internally. They distract us and they diffuse our energy. So whether you're Buddhist or not, or believe in future lives or not, if you want to make this life meaningful, you need focus. Do you agree? Focus, you know? And so Shine is not necessarily even a Buddhist technique. They talk about Shine in the Hindu tradition. They talk about it in a lot of traditions. It's just that our reason for Shine is this developmental process to full enlightenment. But even if you just developed it as a skill, divorced from the path from enlightenment, it would make all of your actions far more powerful. So I'll just put that summary part of the um, Shine section on the screen and just have a look at it and see if there were any parts you wanted to revisit before we kind of leave it for now. So there was that picture. And <clears throat> so we have the monastery renunciation, leaving the monastery through the power of hearing the monk which is us. And then he holds the hook, power of introspective awareness, the lasso or the rope, power of mindfulness, and then these six bends, the six powers. And then these sensory objects, I think that's what's very important for us to look at at our stage, is these are our temptations, basically saying, don't worry about evolved happiness or deep happiness or altruistic happiness. Just feed your senses. Come on. <laughs> Even though that's what we've been doing the whole time and it has not yet led to our awakening. They really do try to capture our attention. Then we have, you know, our elephant, heavy, coarse laxity, which is totally out of our control at our stage, and our monkey mind, restlessness and distraction. We haven't even gotten to subtle laxity up here with the hair. So most of us are kind of hanging out in this area where the elephant is not at all subdued. I think that if by the end of your human spirit semester, you can get your focus to at least here, where see the elephant is starting to look behind and the monk has roped him. He's still ahead of him, he's still pulling him, but there's some control. I think that that's achievable for us all. I think we could get to this stage, maybe even further, but I think that this is something really good to aim for, where we at least have some degree of control. Yunten. Sure. Hey. Where exactly Shine comes in the path? Is it accumulation? Is it all until seeing? Where exactly is the Shine? Shine is needed for the beginning of the path of preparation, so the second path. Yeah, you could develop it earlier, you know, it's like, but it's like you can't go any farther than the, you know, than that kind of entry point unless you have Shine. So some people would have it even before they have any renunciation or bodhicitta. But um, basically, to get to the path of preparation, you need Shine and insight conceptually. And then you repeat it, repeat it, repeat it until it becomes perceptual. And that's the path of seeing. Um, can I ask yeah. something about a renunciation? Yeah, um, sure. We can see that even after one achieves renunciation, right? Still, the sensory uh, object uh, objects are still there along the along the way. So, um, is is renunciation? Um, not giving up on, on sensory objects? Renunciation is the determination to be free. So it's like the will that wants to get out of samsaric cycles. So you're not renouncing sensory pleasures, you're renouncing attachment to sensory pleasures. So it's the difference between like 
I don't know, a little kid who's like four years old and you put a block of chocolate in front of them and say, you can have one piece, but there's the whole block there. A very little child will be like, I'll have one piece and then two pieces and then the whole thing and then I'll be sick, but I don't care and I still want more. And then the child gets a little bit older and says, you can have one piece and they can actually have one piece and enjoy it and leave the rest of it, even though they're tempted. They know that more pieces won't mean more happiness, right? You know, I don't know developmental stages. You have to correct me on the age timeline. But you know what I mean? It's like this with renunciation where you can use... 38. 38. (laughs) I don't know. I'm still checking, (laughs) but... Look, it's, it's an interesting one to explore because you can use sensory objects without being attached to sensory objects, right? You can enjoy sensory objects without being attached to sensory objects. So renunciation is not renouncing the objects, it's renouncing the attachment, the exaggeration, right? So what you're saying with renunciation is, I am determined to break the spell. I'm, in ter- I'm determined to unlearn this lie that says my happiness comes from my senses. So, yeah, so you're taking the power back from your senses and you're saying, sure, chocolate can be a condition for my happiness, sure, but it's not the substantial cause. I know that. If I'm full of grief and sorrow, that chocolate will have no taste And if I'm full of joy, I could have a tiny corner and it could just bliss me out and delight me beyond all measure. So if it was the chocolate from its own side, it would always have the same effect. And it doesn't have the same effect. It has a different effect, different times of your mind meeting with that sensory experience. And we already know that, but renunciation is choosing to remember that again and again So that we don't just get sucked into this whole consumer driven way of life, which destroys our planet, which destroys our wealth, which keeps us greedy, which makes us miserly and we suffer. You know, samsara is a fundamentally disempowering mental state. You know, you lose all of your ability to make your own joy because you think joy comes from the outside. So, so don't get lost by the word renunciation, right? You're not renouncing the senses, you're renouncing attachment. But it's not like we already deal with the attachment, right? I need an enlightenment to deal with the attachment. It's just the motivation. It, it's, it's, like, it's not like a sudden shift, right? It's not like you go from having attachment to having no attachment. You know, it's gradual. So it's with renunciation, like it's like you've really decided this is a big project in your life, mm-hmm. so much so that it's always in the back of your mind and it informs all of your choices. So it doesn't mean you're perfect at it and it doesn't mean that you don't still get distracted, but you have like a worldview that is deep and consistent that is always held by samsara is a lie, I tell myself. I'm going to try not to believe it. What do I need for renunciation? Like, what is the proof for renunciation? Your life so far. (laughs) Right? All of the mistakes you've ever made? No, what is the proof that I have achieved renunciation? Ah, I see. (laughs) (laughs) You're not captivated by sensory experiences. Right? You could see all of your favorite things and say, isn't that lovely? And not need them. Consistently. Yeah, consistently. Without, you know, without kind of a, the tug. You know, you could have all of your greatest temptations in front of you, whether it's people or situations or landscapes or objects or food or whatever. You could have everything that tempts you, that seems to be saying, I will give you happiness if you merge with me, (laughs) you know, and you'll say automatically, I don't believe you. Genuinely from your heart. So, so we've broken the spell of a few things already in our life, and it's just a process of doing that on purpose, actively and consistently. 
you know, and, and it's so easy to just get swept back up in our habits, you know, like we'll finish class and then what will we do? We'll probably go to the bathroom and then like have a cup of tea or have a coffee or drink something or eat something with the idea that these are the necessary components for my relief, relaxation, recovery, and happiness. And if I don't have them, I can't have relief and recovery and relaxation and happiness. You know, and if for some reason my tea kettle breaks or my coffee machine breaks, my day is ruined, you know. And renunciation is saying, you can have your coffee, just don't believe it. Yeah, and in a way you can almost enjoy things more, not less. You know, and so I, I think it's really important that we understand renunciation is not depriving oneself of pleasure, it actually gives you more pleasure, the more renunciation you have. Is there a, a psychological term for this kind of thing? For someone who is not captivated by all of the sensory things about all the worldly ambitions about, I don't know, superficial stuff? Do you call it what your grandiose narcissistic needs or something like that? What are the no, words? Without, I think without addiction. Without Living addiction. Without addictions. Yeah. And without addictions, not only the um, kind of socially unacceptable addictions, but like the deep, deep addictions that are just in our daily life that are completely socially acceptable and no one would ever confront us for having those are the ones that we need to really deeply look into you know like if we smoke I don't know pot or like methamphetamine our friends and family will say are you okay <laughs> right but if you have a cup of tea no one's going to question your cup of tea and there's nothing wrong with a cup of tea in and of itself but is your hungry mind desperate for it? Has your attached mind given all the power to it? And how many things in a day have we done that with? And how much time do we waste because of it? And, you know, the thing is, is that usually the thing that we've given the power to doesn't even work the way we want it to. So there's an edge of disappointment with it as well. It's like some days the coffee really hits the spot. It's like the perfect thing. And you just excellent back into the day. And some days you're just like, that's really not what I expected. That's not as good as that one time. I wish it was better. It's too hot. It's too cold, too much milk, not enough milk. I hate this cup. I love this cup. You know, like we even ruin the thing that we've given the power to. You know, we might have our odd sleep routines, like I can only sleep if I do this, this, and this, you know, and then I have to do this and this to distract myself or decompress or whatever. And if we never challenge those behaviors, we miss out on deeper development. Yeah, Dory? What if uh, we do uh, all these things without... Um... Uh, thinking about it at all, we're doing it uh, automatically. It's the same, right? The the same in terms uh, of what? Without without putting so much meaning to the coffee, it it can be um, a certain um, superficial. I mean, uh, you do things automatically. You. You don't uh, necessarily think this is uh, the the you, the the the, uh, the real happiness, but there is a problem when you when you do things automatically too, right? It's a bigger problem because you don't even realize that's what drives you, right? That's that's what gets us into this kind of like consumer driven bottomless pit thing is that half of the things we do to try to get happiness we haven't even identified that that's why we do them we don't have that conversation in our mind like now i will have my coffee because it will make me happy you don't say that in your head you just go for the coffee automatically because you are so hardwired to assume this is what you need 
right? And I mean, how many times have maybe when we were younger, we were kids with our family or whatever, or teenagers camping, and we simplified our life on purpose. And suddenly now we're living in a little cloth tent with one can of beans and water from the river that we had to boil. And you're suddenly so happy that you were able to make yourself happy with almost nothing. Like how empowering it is when you suddenly realize you didn't need all of that. But of course, then the novelty wears off and it's the tendency of the mind to elaborate. You know how if you have a small house, you will fill your small house with things. And then you move to a bigger house with the same amount of things. And gradually you will fill up the big house. You don't usually just keep the same amount of things, even though those amount of things worked just fine in your little house and you were happy in your little house, but now you're in a big house, you must fill the space. You know, we're constantly filling and filling and filling and it's so automatic. We don't realize how much of our life we've lost to that nonsense and how much presence we've lost with other people because we're just trying to get to our next satisfaction hit, like a drug addict. You know, like what if someone interrupts you in your break, <laughs> you know? It's like, how much presence do you have for people if they're getting in the way of your attachment scenario? You know, you can, you can be so rude to people when all you want is your coffee because you've given all the power to the coffee if you hadn't given all the power to the coffee, someone could interrupt you and you could be present with them and then go have your coffee, <laughs> right? It's not like you have to say, no, I'm not allowed coffee because I'm a bodhisattva. It's not some martyrdom trip. It's like a deep reality check. You intended, but I think we give the power to the coffee or whatever else because we don't experience ourselves as uh, having the power within the mind without any, you know, support from outside. Yeah, so yeah. This is the real experience that we have, that we need well, this support and we need to rely on all kinds of structures and materials and substances and people and so on. Yeah. Yeah, and even to have the conversation is a big deal. Most people spend their whole life and don't even have this conversation with themselves. They just assume all the joy in their life comes from external things and they give their whole life to that and die somewhat dissatisfied. You know, what was it all for, right? Um, and some people die very satisfied and think, what a lovely life full of all sorts of human interactions and indulgences and pleasures and what was the legacy of I don't know pollution behind them and the legacy of consumption behind them and what what did they leave humanity as the result of a life lived in that way you know two things one it's so interesting we teach our children so many things but we hardly talk about what is what is the meaning of life or what is what gets us happy so how can we know what is the meaning of life and what do we need to be or to do to be happy? Like everybody struggles alone because nobody teaches us. And um, the second thing I thought is like, it's interesting because in self-psychology, we talk about a merging with a self-object. So sometimes like I have a patient that is constantly talking about her chocolate and how she has to merge with the chocolate. Now, the, the merging with the chocolate has a lot of, um, like she needs to, in order to, um, uh, to hold this experience, it has a lot of rules, not to eat twice in the morning. Like, like it has a lot of rules to, like to guard the experience. Um, but we do talk about merging with an outside figure or, and maybe that's what we're doing with all these objects. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's just, it's somehow allowing yourself to live an ordinary life with ordinary pleasures 
without believing it. You know, it's like, this is the reason why we do the Heart Sutra is that it has this push and pull between here's this structure and this reality and this structure and this reality, none of which exists in and of itself. And this structure and this necessary technique and this outline and this process and these tools, all of which are wonderful and useful, but don't exist in and of themselves. You know, so you say to yourself, okay, I need you know, human kindness, I need meaningful work, I need resources and support, and you do, but not in and of themselves, and not in the way that you've told yourself you need them. And, you know, it's like you kind of just do this dance where you're sightseeing your own illusion, starting with your own eye. This is, you know, a quote from Lama Zoba Rinpoche. So, yeah, Rachele, yeah. You know, Yunda, I think I heard from many people that uh, something from this uh, renunciation, renunciation, I don't know in all this meaning, uh, happened to them through all the locks down that were now in the COVID period. I hear it. It's from many people. Yeah, it can start to like uh, give us this understanding of what was actually needed and what wasn't needed. Yeah, I, I think it can be really useful, but also the horrible depression of if you don't have the things that you used to rely on, but you also have no inner resources, then you just totally fall apart. You know, so people that had some sort of inner refuge in something are coming to really deep new understandings, but lots of people are also suffering terribly because they never had those structures to begin with and now there's nothing to distract them, you know. And probably most people are somewhere in between. <laughs> yeah, sorry, Khalia. Yeah. Hi, I wanted to ask something in addition to what Osnat started to ask about us in psychology relating to self objects that part of them are humans, not all of them, are, but most, especially at the beginning, are humans, uh, the self object that we think we need for development. And you're talking about uh, doing it alone. Uh, but I wanted to ask about this thing. And again, and another thing about merging with the guru, usually, uh, uh, while meditate, meditating on visualization of the Buddha or some uh, other uh, teacher. So what is the point of that if we're not um, believing on merging with something outside. You know, it's a gradual thing and it's like not like there isn't anything outside. It's just that our relationship to it is distorted. So what we're doing is this like gradual evolution of upgrading where we are now to where we want to be. So like for the guru, for example, in the beginning, there's a person who you talk to, who you relate to, who has teachings that you want, who has qualities you aspire to, and you think of that personality. And then it grows and evolves and deepens to the point where that person's kind of essence, you realize was actually your own inner guru listening right? And you realize that what you saw outside of yourself was actually what you saw inside of yourself uncluttered, you know? And gradually the idea of merging with the guru becomes merging with the divine that no longer needs a personality or a person outside of yourself to merge with, even though it's weird to think of merging with something that isn't out, you know, it's, it's a different kind of outside, yeah. So it's, it's a gradual process. You know, there's the introductory relationship and then the evolution into something that is much more and vast and about ideals rather than personality traits that becomes a deeper inner conversation. But it had to start with a very deep outer listening. But there's some sort of transition you feel when you're listening very, very deeply for wisdom all the time, when you're in this like listening for the guru mindset, you listen long enough and you realize that who was listening was the place of development. You know, your own ability to hear truth 
was the thing that was causing your own evolution. And you needed something outside of yourself to touch that and feed that in some way. But it wasn't actually the main point. It was just a condition. And so how, how big a deal it is and how much a condition it is changes over time as you kind of mature. Which is, you know, I think similar to how you guys talk about idealized self objects, right? Similar. Yeah, Talia? But there's always, the, even merging with the divine, there's always something there outside that stays outside in a sense, or? I mean, yes, but no, it's almost like it stays outside and then you join it, you know? Like the Dharmakaya mind of all the Buddhas, you know, just keep, sh it's like you're a little drop and they're the ocean and you like your little drop goes into the ocean. Um, we'll just, uh, now we'll do some uh, dedication and we'll do May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. Okay, so Wednesday's class is uh, review the 12 links and um, I'll see you on Monday. <laughs>